But here's my question, and this is a possible segue for you. Okay. If Eric Snowden did go on TV, he doesn't say he wants to renounce citizenship, but he like details how he's helping Putin fight the war in Ukraine. Are we in a different territory in terms of what he can expect to happen from the United States and why? It's a really good question. And this whole thing legally is on uh, interesting footing. I think one of the beautiful things about the law that uh, you learn in law school and maybe just through living through the world is that if there's not a law, especially if you're in power, if there's not a law that allows us to do something, you can just make it up. You can create a norm. You can create a norm. It's called normative lawmaking. Yeah. China loves it. And every time we do it, we become more like China. Yeah. Normative lawmaking says whatever the person in charge says, that's the law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So So why are you being coy? What does this all mean? (laughs) What are we talking about next? We're talking about a situation in which... uh, Where does the limit go? Where are we finding the limit? We find the limit with uh, a man named Anwar al lucky He is the first U.S. citizen to be assassinated, essentially, without due process. Uh, he was killed by a drone strike under President Obama in Yemen. Yeah. Um, as well as another U.S. citizen um, who was in, in the car that was hit with him. And... Yeah, so he found, he found where that border of citizenship protection is... And he found himself on the other side of it. Give us, give, tell us what the story is there. That sounds that that sounds frightening. A U.S. citizen got bombed. What? It's it. It is frightening. And uh, but lawful, you say? According to the Justice Department, in uh, in 2010, we're going to talk uh, about whether it's lawful, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Tell, tell, tell me the story. <laughs> so Anwar al was born in Michigan. Um, his dad was Yemeni. Came over here on a grad program. He was born. Um, went back to Yemen, was raised there, and then came back to the U.S. Um, for school. So Anwar comes to, to school in the U.S. Um, he's kind of like a normal, uh, normal college student. Um, his roommates uh, talk about partying with him, you know, smoking cigs, drinking. Um, he, they do note that he starts to get pretty obsessive about the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, starts to get interested in politics. Uh, Desert Storm happens under Bush 1 the uh the prequel to the iraq war essentially and this kind of sets anwar off uh he starts speaking openly about wanting to join the mujahideen and in late 91 um he travels to to afghanistan um, where they're kind of like long story short wrapping up a, a long civil war where the soviets came in um al-qaeda and the taliban were essentially created under u.s support bin laden was armed this this whole scenario um, yeah, Tom Hanks helped with that. He did, I think. Tom Hanks helped yeah. with that, yeah. <laughs> um, Great movie. So Anwar yeah. essentially gets on the bus too late. He shows up there in 91. Nothing's really happening anymore. Um, and by a few accounts, he spends basically a year sitting in, in coffee shops there talking to Mujahideen uh, warriors and uh, that comes back to the U.S. and starts telling other stories. Um, discovers that he's a natural born public speaker um to his dad's dismay his this this guy nasser his father um tried to redirect him so many times throughout this story um to to engineering to uh, in real estate investment his dad basically at many different turns tried to kind of saw where he was going saw him getting increasingly radicalized tried to steer him away didn't work um basically he gets an engineering job quits in the first couple He's weeks like, bombs are good bombs are good <laughs> bombs are good and that's gone. fun that's exciting leading men on raids against the crazy americans that's fun but but i'm going to teach you how to set up an llc invest in a condo unit and double your money over 10 years how's that sound that's it <laughs> that's how's that it. sound i mean one it is actually yeah. it's really important to note at this um at this point, and we'll get into it in a yeah. second. Um, he was very pro-American at this point. He was proud um, of his dad's connections to America. He uh, enjoyed his life in America. He he, he becomes a, he quits this engineering job and becomes an imam at his local mosque. Um, 
uh, Marius's third cousin. Yeah. And then basically just rises to, f- to fame incredibly rapidly as, as an imam. And in he's California. Known in Colorado, Colorado. initially. In Colorado okay. initially. Um, he's known for being super, super colloquial um, and kind of gets more colloquial as he gets more conservative. So he gets, mm. he's really diving into the traditionalist um, narratives, diving into conservatism and getting, you know, sponsoring youth groups on college campuses or, you know, bro, come on, the hijab, you know, bro. He's like, he says the word bro. He, he's just incredibly easy to talk to and uh, people love him. He's, um, he's kind of like the Jerry Falwell Jr. at, at this point of the, um, in a mom circles before the prostitutes wait a second before the pro- oh, okay wait a second okay so <laughs> now, i'm talking about jerry falwell yeah i know you are but yeah you gotta hold on really yeah you gotta hold on that's in here so <laughs> uh he's lighting up huge uh huge crowds with his huh. speaking um his dad once again is trying to divest him he gives him like two massive real estate investments he gets it all scammed away immediately um then his first little brush with the law in 96 and 97, he's arrested twice uh, for soliciting underage prostitution. I, did, I swear to you, I didn't look at your notes. I want you to know these hard, these notes that you spent many of your hours preparing during exam week. Yeah. I did not even look at. Whew, and I didn't see that prostitution bit in here. So Jerry Falwell, that's impressive. That's perfect. Did you know that Jerry Falwell Jr. had? Have you I, seen that recent documentary? I mean, no, I haven't. Is it good? You should have. You, oh my God. Is, is there? I, I was fascinated. I drive by Liberty University all the time. And yeah. uh, I've always been fascinated with that guy. Thought I knew the story. We do not know the story. It's, it is, it's unreal. What's that? Uh, what's that? Um, eastbound and down guy. Is the righteous gemstones? What's it called? The- yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Righteous gemstones. Yeah. yeah. So it's got Will Ferrell. Could you see, could you, I'm just saying, could you see a version of that? But with the moms. That's who this guy is. The, no. Yeah. I mean, I, he's I, Kenny I, Powers. He's Kenny Powers. He's in the mom version of Kenny Powers. As Kenny Powers like as you could be uh, and still be accepted into the general US Muslim community, that's, that's the edge he was towing for sure. That's um, amazing. Was, yeah. And it, it gets even more explicit. Um, that's amazing. Okay, yeah. so, so he gets scammed away from his investments, and he's kind of this party hard, eastbound and down version uh, of an imam. The most closeted party hard. You have to keep, keep in mind that he is okay. becoming the centerpiece for like... Um, he's the Lindsey for kind Graham. Of, for Lindsey kind of progressive Graham. Islam in, in the US. Oh, I see. He's, but he's like considered a progressive preacher and, and progressive imam. I guess, I guess progressive actually isn't a great word because his... his message is incredibly conservative when you dig down to what his actual beliefs complete traditionalist very conservative but his manner of speaking his colloquialism um is drawing in a lot of young um a lot of young people in, in the Got u.s it. so he's who he's um he's relatable he's relatable he's, he's very relatable he's hokey he's yeah and he you know he has um he was raised in america he has you know he sounds like one of us essentially um and he's he's using that um to get across really, really extreme views. Uh, actually, you know, at, at this point, his extremity is, is kind of a gradual rise. So, so at this point, he's still, um, this is pre-9-11, which um, we, sh- we should get into that. So right, okay. right in 2000, he moves from Colorado to Virginia, one of the largest mosques in the country. It's right outside of D.C. Um, and becomes the head imam there. Uh, huge, huge, huge position. Um, and ironically, the leaders of this mosque, uh, they reached out to him um, because they were worried. Of, so so Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda was basically getting more and more successful. Um, Bin Laden had already declared a war on the U.S. at this point. They're becoming more successful in their um, internet marketing, for lack of a better word. Um, so this mosque starts to become a little concerned about radicalization within their own ranks. They hired this guy uh, to come in. And that was a mistake. Turned out to be a big mistake. Um, yeah. <laughs> and notably, two, uh, two of the 9-11 hijackers um, would see him regularly at this mosque. Um, that becomes a little 
more uh, important what, later. Where in Virginia is the is the mosque? What I read was that it's uh, pretty close to DC. Um, so in Virginia, uh, not okay. far, not maybe far Arlington. from the capital. Maybe Arlington. Maybe Arlington. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, notably two of these hijackers. I think one of them had seen him in Colorado. Also, the FBI is starting to kind of get uh, pay attention to to him. Um, there were some closed door meetings that comes out later with these hijackers. Um, but still, at this point, uh, Bush is running. He's supporting Bush. Uh, you know, he likes his conservative views. He's still very, very, very mainstream. Um, I wonder if he sees, he sees himself in Bush, if he's this guy that kind of like says bro and, you know, at talk, the time. Talks. Yeah, because yeah, that was Bush's whole thing. Totally. Totally. He's, you know, family values, likes to party. Yeah, he know? likes to party. <laughs> Which go together fine. So right? great. Yeah. Um, 9-11 happens. Yeah. And um, he becomes the news circuit guy in the U.S. Um, he's on CNN. He's on Fox. He's everywhere. Um, speaking out really openly against Muslim jihad, against violence. Um, and his message at this time was basically the U.S. Muslims need to be a bridge. Um, at this time, he also buys his first TV ever to watch himself on it. Um, interestingly enough. Um, he buys a TV to watch himself on He'd it? He'd never owned a TV, becomes his talking head, and uh, bought a TV to watch himself. So this is also the, the exact time that he starts watching porn. <sighs> Osama bin Laden caught with uh, <laughs> lots of porn in his Pakistani hideout. It seems to be a, a thing. So My uh, next little bullet point here might be of interest, but yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you go on. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, the guy <laughs> solicits prostitutes and I was like, Oh, I got a TV. It's like, Oh, why'd you get a TV, man? Oh, um, to watch myself on TV. I've been on TV. That's why I got a TV. It's like, really? Oh yeah. Why do you have a DVD player? Oh, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm recording myself and then yeah. I'm playing myself with myself. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, this is all going on. He's the talking head, and then steadily after 9-11, we all remember uh, terror cells become a big buzzword. Uh, investigations turn inward in the U.S., you know, looking at the domestic uh, Muslim community. Um, his speeches and response start to get progressively angry. You know, this is a war on all Muslims, etc. Um, comes out during this time, or the FBI launches an investigation during this time um, because an escort comes out and says that he paid for her sex paid her for sex on Ramadan in this, uh, in this hotel in Washington. Um, um, you're not supposed to have sex during, during Ramadan. Was it, um, was it full on sex or was it something she, more limited? She accused him of paying her for a blowjob in the hotel. Um, but was it halal? It had to be. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that too. Somehow I missed that in my research. Uh, it must've been. Yeah, knowing this, I mean, yeah, I mean, the picture is starting to emerge. This is like a spoiled American kid who likes to party and is becoming Jerry Falwell Jr. I yeah, think that's, but he's a complete hypocrite, right? So this, this escort comes out, the FBI uh, kind of sees an intro to dig into more of his personal life. So they start looking for terror links, you know, any links he has to, um, to Al Qaeda, et cetera, et cetera. They find absolutely nothing. What they find is an absolute mountain of prostitutes so many he's like ruining his finances he's he's pro probably a sex addict although that, that was never uh reported so they just find find this massive prostitution problem so you know they pressure him he, he probably sees a few options you know cooperate blah, blah blah get this stuff released ruin my whole career um so he runs to the uk instead he just pieces out so he's like uh i could either deal with this prostitute problem like a responsible man, a leader of my community. Oh, look at that. The Concord has tickets 40% off. What a deal. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> I think I'll do that instead. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So, but his father must have had a lot of money. Yeah. Is what it's like. You know, it wasn't like a little money. If this guy was like buying him real estate investments. and No, no. He, com he comes from a well-off. Uh, he comes from a well-off family. Um, he always spoke highly of his childhood. He was... Uh, yeah, he's the persecution that became like central to his narrative of radicalization does not apply to him at all. And yeah. and well, it may have legitimacy. Um, what what he's, a, he's what, not it. 
what a disservice to American Muslims. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So it's interesting, right? So these leadership problems that plague every society on earth, whether it's uh, a nation, which is just a community of people that want to help each other, or it's, it's a religious group, uh, look at what they did, right? So the lure of power in a man who clearly has charisma yeah. and clearly has a giant ego that can't be satiated, it creates somebody that had personality problems, turns him into a monster, and then that person, as we will see, contributes mightily to the monstrification of American Muslims yeah. after 9-11. Yeah. And that's why you have to pick your leaders wisely, <laughs> but really, they didn't know. Yeah. All this is behind closed doors. I mean, that, that's the whole point, is he's a monster. That's the tragedy of this whole it's a tragedy. story, is yeah. that he's, he's such a little freaking dweeb. He, like, he runs yeah. away from every single problem that, that hits him in the face. Um, and the more persecuted he personally believes, the more radicalized his online speech gets, the better he gets at it. Um, and then we only have a little way to go in this, but he, he starts getting really good at inciting people to violence. Yeah, um, so he's like a Milo Yiannopoulos. Oh, God, yeah, with... That no talent piece of shit. This guy yeah, has way no, more talent than him. Yeah. Way more. Yeah. 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 Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 okay. So, so the story continues. Yeah. So he's, he's in the UK. The US um, tries to get him extradited. He runs away again to Yemen, uh, where he remains. Um, once there, uh, he's reunited with his family tribe. Yemen is a brutal, awful place. First country in the world. Do you know what it's first at? First country ever. In world history to run out of water. Oh, they wow. officially ran out of their own water in 2014. That is terrifying. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a brutal place in a lot of regards, um, with really easily drawn connections to us intervention and stuff like that, especially if you're looking for those connections. Um, so he moves there. He feels increasingly persecuted. He starts, uh, combing the Quran for excuses for violent jihad. Uh, which are hard to find in the Quran because that's not what jihad is at its core. Um, and the FBI all the while is kind of circling him. Um, but with nothing, re they can't really decide if he's like a Milo Yiannopoulos or if he's actually connected with Al-Qaeda making anything happen. Um, so, you know, to come back quickly, his um, legal options, his citizenship, et cetera, aren't really being considered yet. He's just kind of like a fly in their ear. Um, while he's in Yemen to cooperate with the U.S., um, Yemeni officials arrest him and keep him in. But it is interesting that at this point, he is still seen as what we have now on the right, which is as a troll, kind of a troublemaking loudspeaker at a time when the internet's not as powerful. Right. That's the other thing. Yeah. The internet's not as powerful, so it's not as obvious. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you have to go www.veryspecificwebsite.com, you know, yeah. slash yeah. to, to find him at this point. Um, but it does worry me just speaking out loud here when I do see these extremely powerful radical figures um, rising up all over the world that they, that they can essentially go viral in a thousand different ways. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You look at Andrew um, Tate. Mm hmm. Very weird. Uh, origin story ran he says Bulgarian casinos probably has ties to major human trafficking rings coming out of Europe was a UFC fighter at one point but like let me tell you who gets money and status to run Bulgarian casinos mafia traffickers do Andrew and he, Tate the success coach talking yeah angel. yeah oh yeah, my, yeah. I, and, well, and I'm proud of myself because I just hated him on like uh Prima fascia. Yeah, prima fascia. <laughs> absolutely. And he just sort of rises through algorithms to billions of views. That's what people don't oh, realize. He was massive. Billions of views. Well, then he got kind of canned. Yeah. But that's who I think of actually when you describe this, like a modern Andrew Tate. Totally. And yeah, my next uh, bit here is that he starts his own website. And, oh, and my you God. know, back in the time, it's okay. literally yeah. www.unwaralucky.com, okay. I think. Uh, um, and at this point, he's he's full blown radicalized, um, reaching out to people trying to uh, create violent jihad, um, 
at this point. He Andrew gets Tate, in. I should say, um, I don't want to be unfair here. I should say he is Muslim. Yeah. But he's, so I, I, that's not why I drew that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that's yeah. not why I drew that parallel. I didn't know. Who, yeah. 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 Um, so this is uh, this a Muslim is, who runs casinos. Hmm. And also has been accused of human trafficking of women. He and Anwar. And Jerry Falwell. That's a, uh, that's a power trio. And that one rabbi on Dateline who famous, do you remember Dateline MSNBC that caught a catch a predator? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a there rabbi, a rabbi in like the second season and he was like very well known rabbi. Oh my God. And he was there visiting like a 14 year old. Yeah. He's like my eighth grade science teacher, David C. Jones. Let's yeah. get the gang all together. Pedophile. Man. Yeah. Pedophile. Yeah. That. I, I don't know if you caught earlier. He's specifically, Anwar is specifically soliciting underage people primarily. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. 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 So I, just, so just like that. Just like that. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, you're starting to get a picture of this guy when the U S really pricks up their ears. Um, he's in contact with this guy, Nadal Hassan, uh, the Fort hood, Texas shooter. Um, so they basically exchanged emails uh, talked about violent jihad. Um, Hassan goes and shoots up um, this this Army and Navy training center in, uh, in Fort Hood, kills 13 people. Um, Umar, this is another really wild one. He met um, he met with Anwar Anwar in a bomb maker in Yemen, uh, where he's provided with an underwear bomb. I, I don't know if you remember this story. Um, gets Anwar told him specifically don't detonate this until you're over U.S. airspace. So that's a huge thing in the FBI file. Um, this guy waits until he's over Detroit. And this this underwear bomb that they created um, was meant to pass through metal detectors. It was essentially like two different chemicals that you insert a syringe so it's undetectable beforehand. Um, he's so nervous over Detroit. This, this is not funny. Uh, no, it is. <laughs> it mm. is funny. He's so nervous over Detroit, he fucks it up with the syringe and lights his dick on fire. No. He, this is not the shoe bomber guy in Detroit. No, no, no. This guy lights his crotch on fire. On the he plane. lit his dick on fire? Literally burned his dick to a crisp, did not damage the plane. I think there were like minor injuries around him. He's arrested. Um, ties to Anwar. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's, a few, there's many others, actually. There's Bledsoe. Um, that are tied to him. They're all tied These to him. These are all directly tied to him. While um, he's in Yemen. Right, right. So Bledsoe shoot, shot up an army recruitment Zachary center in Little Chesser. Rock. That one's interesting. Yeah, he, he was radicalized online um, and in contact with Anwar and threatened the creators of South Park um, for their portrayal of Muslims. Yeah, that didn't go well for him. Um, I'm a yeah. South Park aficionado. They did not take kindly to that. Yeah, they probably did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so long story short here, uh, Obama's fallen in love with, with drones over his, his presidency. He's a pragmatist. Um, he doesn't like to do things messily. Um, drones are relatively quiet. Um, he starts using them a lot. Um, and essentially, he's Anwar gets put on the kill list, um, which is the list of people that are approved by the president to be assassinated by a drone. Um, before there was any justification from the State Department or any of the White House lawyers. So at this point, Obama is looking for legal. By justification, mean before there's a, uh, there's a memo that exactly. sets out the legal case. Exactly. In case this is, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's on this list and um, the U.S. is looking for legal justification, looking for a way to make this happen. Um, because as, as we know, he's a U.S. citizen and Yemen is not a declared war zone. Um, as we said at the beginning, um, if no law applies, you can just make it up. Um, so essentially the U S state department, um, comes out with a memo that says that it is permissible to kill a U.S. citizen as long as the person posed an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States and that capture is not feasible. Do they have to be off of U.S. soil or can it be on U.S. soil? Does it differentiate? I don't think the the memo that I read it didn't dif differentiate. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So there, there's already at this point, um, the U.S. had already um, attacked Yemen, um, going after Al Qaeda operatives a few different times. The first time in 2010 was um, a really notorious uh, 
Tomahawk missile strike from a Navy ship that killed 50 civilians. That was the first strike in Yemen um, directly from the U.S. Um, and yeah, so, so essentially the, the legal justification didn't really exist. Uh, the ten, at the final hour, the Justice Department comes out with this memo um, and a Predator drone takes out Anwar and a few others in, in a car as they're driving in Yemen. And that is the first time that, that a U.S. citizen uh, was assassinated uh, without, without due process on foreign soil. Okay. The question for me that's hard to answer. It's easy to answer for me, like, should this happen? The answer is like, I know we should not be allowed, we should not allow the government to kill its own citizens. Okay, yeah. without justification. Yeah. The more interesting question then becomes, okay, but where are we saying that the power of the Constitution comes from? Where are we saying that the power of the Constitution comes from? Because the Constitution, which is our agreement amongst ourselves between us and government, where we give up some of our rights um, uh, in order to have certain freedoms, and we also take on certain duties so that we can help and ensure that everybody can take on those freedoms. Like, where does the power to maintain all that come from? And it's one of the key questions you always get in law school, right? Yeah. And so some people say there's a constitutional power that comes from the document itself, but then the power of the constitution comes from the people Mm. and the people are silent on a lot of things. Yeah. Ultimately. But do the people, does the emotion of the people count? Does the emotion of the people count? And so if you're the president and now you're sitting in a position where your, your job is described by the constitution, but you also have to make decisions that on unique questions that are not well described by it and that are, aren't going to be voiced by the people to give it power because that's impossible. Are you feeling out the emotions of the people to make this decision? You know, are you, are you feeling out the people and saying, well, in, a, in essence, this feels like something that America's okay with. That's why this is such an important case for me. Uh, if there's anyone you could justify murdering by drone, I might, I might pick this guy too at, at this point. Right, you know, right, he's, right, right. Absolutely, he's, he's, cons- yeah. he's considered the, um, oh, what was the word that was used? He was... The ace the, of the, mo- the most successful internet Al Qaeda operative. Okay, so then yeah. this guy at this point is uh, establishing contacts all over the globe. You know, I, I listed like four. Um, I think there's at least five or six other um, incidents in the U.S. that were directly related to him. Um, and then you know, just outspokenly um, kill all Americans. He, there's some famous quote where he says, "You don't need to ask any questions before you kill an American." Um, so it's if there's anybody you could justify it for, it's this guy. And then you have to look, uh, you know, what happens down the road, you know, another huge issue of this is we don't really know how the kill list operates. We we don't know how you get put on it, uh, or if you're ever taken off of it. Um, so you have to like make the slippery slope argument, you know, if, if they allow this with him, it's going to be someone who's a little better by four degrees, a little better, a little better. And like, this is where Jill Horowitz, my tort professor, would say, I don't ever want to hear somebody say this is a slippery slope argument again. It's our job as people and our job as lawyers in particular to draw the lines that mm. stop the ball from rolling down the hill. I like that, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, that was one of the things I remember from first year of torts. Jill Horowitz, great professor. Here's what I think. Okay. I think that the limits of citizenship are opaque and often undefined. And because that's true, when somebody goes beyond those limits, you can't look to the Constitution and the laws always to say that they've been passed because those markers simply do not exist. They haven't been drawn up before. Mm. And so Obama's looking at this and probably realizing that he was a constitutional law professor. I'm guessing he had some sense of it. And he's like, I'm making an, not just an extrajudicial call here. I'm making an extra constitutional call here. And I don't have any other way forward for this, pragmatically speaking, right? Because if I try to go to the courts, to the people, try to get permission, try to explain, try to change the law to be able to do this, are people even going to know what I'm talking about? 
So he makes the call. Alawi is, as he said, removed from the battlefield, killed by the United States. A U.S. citizen is killed. And so now the task of a constitutional democracy becomes to look at that act itself and put limits on its future use. Hmm. And one of the failures that we've had, you can say, okay, Obama shouldn't be allowed to do this in the future. Okay, that's a reaction to what he had to do without a map. And I'm not saying he didn't did, commit did, a crime. Did he have to, though? Like, he could have not assassinated him. I don't know. You know? Yeah, he could have not assassinated him. Maybe, yeah, probably. I just, yeah. I, okay, your okay, your yeah. point's really well. T- it's super interesting, but how you just described it, that 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 area of operating out like extra constitutionally. Yeah. That sounds scary as shit to me. It is scary as shit. No, and I'm not saying he's right. I there's a there's a thousand different things he could have done in that extra constitutional space. That's the point, I think. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so we we take a hard look at ourselves too because we are the country that bombs other countries and kills people in other places with drones. That's us. 100%. Right in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not saying that's right. That's just a decision that was made. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot to be debated there. But I'm asking, or I, well, I guess what I'm saying is that one part that we have failed unequivocally since then is to create limits on the power that he created. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It can't. That yeah. action can't remain extra constitutional. Right. The right. constitutional okay. now needs to be stretched to take account of it and to figure out how a decision like that will be made in the future. What it says about citizenship to me is fascinating in that we spent talking about Snowden. We said, hey, citizenship itself is such a strong power. I mean, it's harder than bone. You know, it's easier to take the bones out of a human body than take away your citizenship in some ways. Yeah. Well, that means that citizenship as a power is pretty poorly defined. Right. As a personal superpower, as a superpower, right. And there are going to be lots of questions like this. And for a world heading towards 10 billion, we are going to have to confront this question maybe hundreds of millions, if not billions of times on an individual basis as countries sink borders, right? That were once the ocean move inwards as deserts grow. And we have to figure out what to do, if anything. With climate migrants, we have to figure out how to have our own political debates if we're countries that, you know, would have to receive some of these folks. Yeah. I mean, my, my short thought to that is that, that drones um, are unique here and should be dealt with uniquely because what Congress would say is that we should have been included in this from the beginning. The kill chain is unconstitutional. Like Jeremy Scahill did a ton of really interesting reporting on this. Um, so, yeah. That is interesting because I think the law um, is inherently reactionary in some ways. It has to adapt to realities that didn't exist, right? Um, Power is reactionary. It's still not the law. We still don't know that that's the law, that a president can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But, you know, could we step into extra constitutional territory in a more directed way? That that would be my, I mean, it's just, it's a thought. Can you do it? Can you do it anti? Or does it all have to be done? Is it anti Yeah, that, fair. You know, yeah. Can we do it before it happens? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, and I think if we were a very functional democracy, we would have had that moment and then had the debate and, you know, made a decision right after. And Congress, those spineless assholes, you know, they had a chance right after it happened to do something about it. Right. What year did he get killed? He was killed in, wow, I'm blank right now. I believe it's 2013. 2013. Okay, so that's Obama's second term. Okay, so he doesn't, you know, if if the Republicans want to do something about it, they have the power. They didn't I they have apologize. both chambers? He was killed in two thousand eleven. Two thousand eleven. Okay, so this is split, split. But the Democrats still have some power. I mean, whatever. Okay. I mean, but back to the the congressional thing is along with that argument as if it's you know brought into Congress, then you can bring policy into the into the question. You know, and my view of drone strikes is that they're one of the most um, effective radicalization tools that the U.S. uses. Uh, militarily. No so doubt. Yeah. So there's a lot, a lot of policy stuff that you could bring in um, if it was dealt with in a less clandestine matter. So it's, I, I totally agree. I'm just more, much more interested in the citizenship question. I think there, yeah. there's, there's a whole drone world of, of discussion. 
True. I, sh- um, I should be careful. But but <laughs> but the limits. All right. So citizenship. If you think about it, we go back to our original question: Where does citizenship end? Where do your actions as a citizen of a state clearly end if citizenship is the superpower that you have? Harder to take away from you than the bones in your body. Right. Well, it ends where the Constitution itself ends. Hmm. It ends in the extra constitutional space. Hmm. And so if you take an action that forces someone, a government, to take into consideration actions which are so novel involve so much power that the Constitution doesn't have much say on them, you're in a space where your rights can potentially be very violently curtailed and taken away. Hmm. Yeah. So if I'm, so that's how our story of Unlaki yeah. tells us what, what Eric Snowden can expe- expect. He's probably safe if he continues doing what he's doing because we are, the law has a lot to say about the fact that he asked for Russian citizenship and went on TV and declared his desire to have his children grow up in America. The law has a lot to say there. The law might have much less to say if news came out that he was suddenly leading a cybersecurity unit under Putin and Russia attacking the NSA in the United States. At that point, you are arguably back in that extra constitutional space. And yeah. he is running the risk at that point of his citizenship and his rights as a U.S. citizen being quickly and perhaps, again, violently and suddenly yeah. curtailed. Yeah. Um, that, I think, is the answer. Right. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, yeah. Which is interesting to think about. So it's, again, people think that law covers everything, but it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't. Think of it, uh, think of the law as, as a circle, as like a metal circle, but it's inscribing a ball of energy. And you have those little energy waves, yeah, yeah, you know, like sort of like a drawing of an atom or something, or of of a fuzzy sun. And those energy waves are constantly going above that kind of clean circle. That's power. That's the crackling of power. That's at the outer edges of the law. 